Welcome to the Mind Design Sports Podcast. I'm Brandon, and in each episode, I'll be talking about sports psychology with the guest speaker. If you want to design your sports experience, you've come to the right place. If you want more tips and insights on how to improve your sports performance mentally, check out our website and other podcasts at mind-designsports.org. Hello, everyone. I'm here today with Tessa Berger. Tessa is from New Zealand, and just a little background about her. At 11 years old, she started playing soccer, and she went to be she went on to become the youngest person of any gender to play and score in the Premier League, New Zealand's top flight senior competition. She's also an Adidas-sponsored athlete, currently as she competed on the international stage for nearly a decade. Throughout her career, she represented New Zealand at the FIFA World, Women's World Cup, played NCAA Division I soccer for Florida University, and was shortlisted for the 2012 London Olympics. She received over 40 full scholarship offers. Now she is a director of athletics for a global education company where she assists aspiring student athletes to earn sports sports scholarships to universities. She has played against famous soccer players including Julie Ertz and Crystal Dunn. With all of her knowledge and experience, I thought it would be useful to have Tessa speak to us about her experience as a female athlete. And she's going to help us debunk some common myths as well. Thank you for joining us, Tessa, and I'm excited you're here to speak with us. Thanks for having me, Brandon. I'm excited to be on. Since you're super knowledgeable in guiding student athletes with sports scholarships, can you talk about that? How would you guide young student athletes to get sports scholarships? Yeah, it's a pretty uh, weighted question, um, but I would say the easiest way to you know, support any sort of student athlete that's looking to embark on this journey is really keeping in the forefront of your mind that every single student is different, um, every single athlete is different, and just making sure that across the board um, you're able to provide not just the service, you know, you might be a, um, you know, a parent or a grandmother or a coach that's looking to support a student, um, that you're really thinking about them and what they're uniquely looking for in their collegiate experience, you know, not just athletically, academically, but personally as well. Great. And is it a myth that an athlete plays great and is discovered by someone that gets them all the right connections like a scout? Does that actually happen a lot? I wish it happened for everyone. I was very fortunate in that, um, you know, having the exposure I did at playing at, you know, multiple FIFA World Cups that, um, as you can imagine, it's uh, certainly a bit of a, a melting pot for top collegiate coaches and trying to find new incoming talent. Um, but I would say that that's true of maybe the top 5% of athletes that ultimately get recruited to college programs. It's not something that happens for the everyday athlete that actually gets picked up and um, and beca- goes on to become a collegiate athlete. So um, I think all in all, um, it's, it's not typical of uh, the recruiting process in itself. So then in that in mind, other than playing their best, should student athletes be doing something to maximize their chances? Oh, completely. I think... Um, you know, academic achievement is unfortunately so understated when it become, you know, when it comes to the recruitment process. I think, you know, for as much at Crimson um, as we certainly stress the importance of being able to uh, play and compete at the highest level possible athletically, the reality is, is you know, there's a reason why um, they put the student part first when you talk about being a student athlete. It's that, you know, your grades are just as, if not more important. Um, And something that isn't all that commonly known, um, especially for international athletes, um, but certainly for domestic um, American student athletes as well, is that for as much as you can tap into athletic scholarship funding as an, as an incoming uh, athlete, you can also tap into academic funding as well. So, you know, at Crimson, we, uh, in all honesty, probably have, um, you know, three quarters of our athletes, even our top tier athletes that also pick up academic funding um, on top of the athletic scholarship funding. What do you mean by academic funding? Think of it like coaches have two buckets of funding that they can pull from. The athletic funding, um, they're quite conservative with it because the NCAA does put caps on what amounts of athletic funding each team um, for each sport can actually give out. So if you're able to, as an incoming athlete, meet or exceed the academic benchmarks of the particular university that you're looking at, what coaches can do is tap into the academic funding um, that the university does provide to 
specific programs. So really, um, you know, if you want to make yourself a really well-rounded, um, more marketable recruit, that's certainly a lot more alluring to, to coaches. You make their lives a whole lot easier where they can say, okay, brilliant. You know, maybe we're looking at bringing Tessa in from New Zealand and we're looking at another athlete in Australia. They're both playing athletically at the same level which is great, um, you know, but the reality is, is say, you know, myself as an example, you know, she's she's performing to a high level academically. Um, we can get Tessa in on 60% athletic funding, 40% academic, and we can use that remaining balance of athletic funding to put towards bringing in another top tier recruit as well. So basically they can make their, their athletic funding um, stretch a lot further if they've got incoming recruits that can tick that academic box as well. Okay, got it. That's interesting. And who are some people that you think athletes should get them to help if they want a scholarship? I think it's, you know, naturally, I guess the the first place um, most athletes, myself included, looked was, can you find someone, you know, locally, whether it's a coach or, uh, you know, fellow, you know, friends or schoolmates that have gone through the process as well. I think that's always naturally a a pretty, um, uh, I guess, easy place to start. But the reality is, is, you know, when it comes to this process, not just because it's, you know, become increasingly more difficult to actually get recruited, um, but further to that, how specific the recruitment process is in itself in terms of not just meeting academic benchmarks, but being really tuned into what the athletic recruitment standards do look like. It's also about really key um, elements of this process, such as eligibility and amateurism, meeting core course requirements. And, um, you know, I I myself was in a situation where, unfortunately, at that time, I wasn't able to tap into um, and secure the services of like a recruitment agency and get some formalized support. Um, I really did have to rely on people that I'd known who'd gone through this process. And for me, um, that that didn't work out so well. I mean, certainly the intent was there, um, but the reality is, is, as I say, you know, this is a really competitive process. It's only become more and more, uh, I, I think, you know, it's, it's certainly become a lot more challenging to navigate the ins and outs of actually getting recruited and the easiest and the best thing you can possibly do to maximize your chances. But um, I guess above all, to ensure that you're eligible and able to actually get recruited is, is get some formalized support. Go and, go and utilize an agency um, that does this day in and day out to give you that best, most accurate guidance. Great. For you personally, what were some practical and psychological tactics that you think earned you those 40 plus scholarships? I wish I could say it was, you know, something that I did uniquely through the recruitment process. Um, but I think I'm pretty self-aware to know that a lot of it um, came down in my case to the fact that I athletically was performing at the highest level and competing at the highest level, but also academically, I was really sound. I had a, you know, a perfect GPA. Um, and I think it ticked the two main boxes um, of, uh, of coaches of what they look for. But I think further to that as well, um, I, I really looked beyond just those kind of two key areas of recruitment and said, you know, for as much as I'm sure you're well aware, and especially a lot of American students will be hyper aware of, I also um, unknowingly, and I will say that, um, had a lot of really strong extracurriculars, um, which not a lot of student athletes, pretty much no international student athlete is well aware of, is that, you know, when you're looking to apply to universities and get recruited, it's not just about grades and it's not just about how good you are. It's about, you know, your well-rounded candidacy and the rest of your application as well, including essays, etc. So I was I was pretty um, fortunate in that I'd done a lot of stuff, ex, you know, in terms of extracurricular and leadership roles where when it came down to actually applying, um, I had a pretty strong application too. For those athletes that aren't at that top level like you were, what, were, what do you think you, they can do then? Most of it is looking at what does the rest of your candidacy look like? So what I love so much about what we do at Crimson and, you know, we're the only uh, company in the world in terms of a, a recruitment company that can support student athletes um, and students alike 
with any element of candidacy building needed. So from actually helping you construct essays and build a really clear narrative to extracurricular leadership, mentoring, standardized test tutoring, you name it. Um, what I always say and what I always focus on with my students here at Crimson is, okay, you might not be athletically a D1 caliber recruit, or you might not be a, a recruit that's able to go into division two and secure a full scholarship. But are there other elements of your candidacy that you can build out? The first and the big one is obviously academics. How can you be performing you know, really well across your standardized tests um, and get a really good SAT or an ACT score? Of course, you know, you want a really strong GPA as well. But further to that, what can you be doing um, when it comes to extracurriculars um, and building a really clear narrative over a decent period of time, you know, four or five years? You know, that more than anything um, is the difference maker for those student athletes. So we find ourselves um, working with not just top tier athletes here at Crimson, but we're also working with, you know, strong academics that go, look, um, I'd love to play collegiate sport. I'd love to go to a D3 school um, or, you know, even, you know, compete at the NAIA level. But they're, they're well aware and certainly through our guidance and advice, they know that they're not going to be outright recruited. So the rest of their candidacy, their applications have to be really strong. And then once they gain admission to the university, they can then be a walk-on athlete because I think it's something not a lot of people really know. I mean, in the US, a little bit different, certainly, um, because you guys, you know, live and breathe collegiate sport, but especially for internationals, um, we just don't know that, you know, you might only have five or so players on a soccer team or, you know, a handful, play handful of players on a basketball team where you're actually on some sort of scholarship funding. A lot of the, the, the players on a roster are walk-ons. Um, so we make a lot of, um, you know, dreams possible by ensuring that the rest of their candidacy is really strong, which allows for them to gain admission. And then from there, they're able to walk onto teams and be able to, you know, play collegiate sport. Oh, wow. Thank you for that. Are there certain things that an athlete in middle school or high school should be doing each year or keeping in mind mentally to improve their chances for a scholarship? Or do you think thinking about scholarships gets in the way of playing and is like more of a distraction? Ooh, that's a really, really good question. Um, I think both are true, depending on who you are. I think, um, again, you know, it's about being really hyper aware and recognizing uh, what sort of a player you are. If you're somebody and, and student you are and human being that you are, if you're somebody that's really motivated by goals, setting really clear goals and knowing what standards so say you're you know competing in a times or a measurable sport so say swimming for example it's usually pretty clear especially as you get um closer to your senior year of high school um what sort of times that you need to be meeting in order to compete at each level whether it's d1 d2 d3 etc um so if you're really goals oriented um it's easy for those more measurable sports where you go okay well um if i'm swimming you know sub you know, 110 in the 200 meter fly or whatever it might be, um, you know, I know brilliant, I'm going to be able to be, you know, competing at the, the division one level on paper. Um, so if that's you, fantastic. Um, more subjective sports like soccer or American football or whatever it might be, um, there's a, as you can imagine, a pretty gray area. You know, one coach might like you, um, another coach might not even look twice at you. So I think especially with more of those subjective sports, you just need to focus on being the best athlete you can be and getting to the highest level, but also being really aware that, um, yep, coaches, some are going to love you, some aren't going to love you, and just really focusing on improving. That's the most important thing um, is across the board, as long as you're making strides and making gains every single day, um, chances are there's going to be some sort of opportunity for you. And, you know, it's it's never good to get in your head, especially as a young athlete. And I think it's just keeping that bigger picture in mind that there's probably going to be opportunity um, and there should be opportunity if this is a goal that you're working towards. And don't get so hung up on it's got to be at this level. This is, you know, this is the level that I have to be at in order to make this possible. That's great advice. And you know a lot about international sports, and we have listeners in the U.S. and across the globe. So can you talk about the difference in scholarships that athletes will experience in the U.S. versus a country like New Zealand? 
Yeah, um, it varies country by country. And I think it depends completely on, you know, in your home nation, what are your what are your um, strong set domestic sports? So in New Zealand, uh, we're pretty renowned globally for being um, the best in the world when it comes to rugby union. So I think the All Blacks, which is our, our national team here in New Zealand, across all teams in the world, whether they're professional teams or amateur teams or national teams, they're the most winning team ever in history. Um, they've got the highest winning percentage as a sports team ever, um, which is quite exceptional for being such a small company, uh, country rather, and certainly something that we're really proud of. Um, but, you know, so rugby is a really strong sport in New Zealand. So if you want to get recruited to play rugby collegiately in the US, pretty much you could be playing at the high school level or the first 15, as we call it, um, in rugby in New Zealand, and you could get a full scholarship to a um, you know, to a school such as um, Cal Berkeley. Now, if you're playing basketball in the high school level in New Zealand, knowing how strong obviously the NBA and the player pathway is in the US, you wouldn't even probably be able to walk on to any NCAA team or even an NAIA team. I think, you know, even if you're playing for the New Zealand national team or an age group national team here in New Zealand as a men's basketball player, you'd be hard pressed to go, you know, to a JUCO school. Um, you know, you'd be looking at probably lower, lower, lower tier D2 NAIA um, and even across Division Three. So it really all depends on your country, what sports you're really good at um, as a nation and how does that compare to the level and the standard of the US? Because, you know, American football, basketball, especially, you know, basketball on the men's side of the game, um, it's so hard as an international um, to get recruited or even to be a walk-on um, because the standard locally in the US is just so high. Um, so that's the easiest way of looking at it. Okay. And I'm going to shift back to you and your story. So was it difficult to be so young in pro sports? Like mentally, it must have been challenging since you were years younger than your teammates, right? And your opponents. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, it was. It was a pretty interesting experience I think you know going in and playing at the highest level in New Zealand I was I think I was uh I wasn't even 11 I think I was like 10 and a half which sounds absolutely bizarre and I can promise you that the standard of play was actually very high um it was I was just you know I was quite tall and certainly like physically able to compete so that side of it wasn't um as challenging but emotionally, uh, mentally, it was tough. I mean, I've been really fortunate that from a young age, um, you know, I was I was always beyond my years. So it wasn't as hard of a transition um, and adjustment as I think it would be for most young players. Um, but the, the biggest thing for me or the biggest obstacle for me, I think mentally in playing up, you know, and playing with women at 11 years old was, trying to, I think, manage expectations. Um, that was a pretty tough one for me to get my head around because, you know, you suddenly go from being a young person and, and being a child, you know, I was a child um, where, of course, you know, there's room for failure. Um, and for the most part, you know, you're able to try and, you know, be in a position where you'll have coaches and parents that say, oh, that's fine, you know, that happens, you're going to take five shots and you might get one goal and missing four is okay. Whereas when you get into that adult environment, the expectations are very, very, very high um, and you're really held accountable to those. So I think being treated as an adult across the board was um, was not so difficult for me, um, but really around that expectations piece, I had to adjust quite quickly to the bar is very high. And if you don't meet that bar, you're going to know about it and it's not going to be sugar coated. So I, I think in a way I had to harden up emotionally very quickly um, and just be okay with absorbing and taking on board that, that feedback and that criticism. Um, and I guess not letting it get in my head too much, which for a young person, you know, as a child, you're very impressionable um, and try not to take it personally and really, yeah, trying to take that, that feedback as, um, you know, helpful critique rather than just outright, um, you know, criticism. Yeah. And also as a woman in sports, 
Um, what advice would you give to young women, uh, young women athletes? Probably the biggest piece of advice, you know, having been there and done it and, you know, played at the highest level is ensure that, you know, and I say this not just for female athletes, but particularly for female athletes, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, really be um, conscious of the fact that, you know, you might go pro, you might not. Um, you might have a playing career that spans 15 years professionally. You might play professionally for one season. Really think about, especially when you're young and thinking about, you know, going down the pro pathway or even becoming a collegiate athlete, think about what would my future look like if I don't have a 15 year professional career? What can I be doing or what would I be doing outside of that? Um, and always yeah, essentially be looking at what those other alternatives do look like because, you know, you're, you're only as good as um, the level you're able to compete at and you're only as good as, um, you know, your body essentially as well. You know, our body is our vehicle. So if you get injured and have a career ending injury two years into going pro, um, then what do you, what does the rest of your life look like? So always be thinking about, um, especially for women, especially for women, be thinking about, what do those other avenues look like? Because you can only play for so long. Um, and, you know, ideal situation, you might, you know, your professional career might take you into your early 30s, mid 30s. What happens after that? I know you're like a director of athletics. So what are some other jobs that are similar to this in sports? Yeah, um, I think, you know, there are so many different avenues and so many different pathways. Of course, you can look um, at the medical side of things and getting involved at becoming a sports doctor, a physiotherapist, a sports psychologist. You could look at the coaching route. Um, you know, there are so many different types of um, obviously coaching and levels that you can coach at from juniors right the way through to, you know, your top international A license where you could be coaching um, national teams. Um, you know, you can be at you know, sports directors at schools, you name it. Um, there's so many sports management, you know, that's huge now as well, you know, managing um, international athletes or even amateur athletes. Um, there are just so many opportunities available to you if you're interested in um, still, I guess, staying tied to the sports world. Um, but of course, you know, we're human beings, athletes, we can do a lot more than, than, than just play or, um, and certainly we have, uh, I dare say, a lot more interests that fall outside of sports. So, um, you know, no full as full well as well that, you know, of course, um, you can pursue, you know, be pursuing rather many pathways outside of just the direct sports field. Great. And just back to my prior question, what was the hardest part about being a girl in the sports world? Oh, just the, just so much uncertainty. I think it's we're in a position now where we're at a a really interesting point in history. We are, we're truly starting to see the tides begin to turn um, across the women's um, sporting landscape where women's sports are starting to finally get the funding and the investment that they deserve, certainly across the board. Unfortunately, we're not at the point where, um, you know, we've got pay parity or outright equality, but we are finally beginning to trend in a positive direction. Um, but I think one of the hardest things for me and was certainly true of my experience was knowing that there wasn't a clear pathway, there wasn't clear financial stability um, in becoming a pro in my sport. So um, that, yeah, that was the biggest challenge that I, I faced um, internally was, okay, well, if I do go pro, um, actually what's that going to look like financially for me? Because the reality of women's uh, football um, or, or soccer at this point is still that you've got the best players in the world that um, are playing not just for their national team and not just exclusively for one club as the men's players would. So if you're Sergio Ramos um, and you're playing for Real Madrid in Spain, that's your one club team. You know, he plays throughout the year um, and when they're in the off season, they're in the off season. And of course he captains the Spanish national team as well. Um, so he'll do that when, you know, Spain are playing international games, but he only has to play for one club team. You'll see professional women's soccer players that are playing for two to three different club teams in one year. 
And that's because, you know, you're on, you know, the reality is, is, you know, you're not getting paid enough by your one club team to be able to actually sustain um, and afford living across the 365 days. So, um, you know, female athletes have to put their bodies through uh, a lot more training, um, a lot more competition and have ultimately a lot less downtime and recovery time in the off season because they're just trying to play enough where they can get paid enough to continue being pro athletes. I understand. And you talked to me about the difference in sport, support when you were an athlete in the 80s and 90s versus now. What do you mean by that? And how is the support different? I think there was no support. So I was I was born in 94 um, and ended up, yeah, coming through a time where, um, you know, there was just no real investment in the game. Um, and of course, you know, even I think prior to that, you know, if you look across the 80s and the early 90s when women were, uh, were, were playing at the highest level across a whole multitude of different sports where there was there was just it was deemed for the most part social so there's been a massive shift where now what look we're coming into 2021 next year and young girls can see okay you know you're five or six and you can see professional athletes that are getting paid to to compete at the highest level in their their sport year round um travel do everything that a, a male athlete will be able to do and get compensated adequately for that um, and I, th- I think it's just been a huge shift, essentially, in the span of 30 years or so, um, and even less than that, in all honesty, I think the reality is it's probably closer to the last 10 years, um, where we've seen a lot of sports go from being social or more just organised sports, certainly at the amateur level, to now they're fully fledged, um, uh, invested in professional sports. Okay. And... Do you think athletes are treated differently now and actually get more mental support since we as a society are more aware and vocal about mental health and emotional support? Yeah, I, I, there's again been such a a massive shift, I think, in the last five to 10 years across both um, men's and women's sports to understand more about sports psychology, mental health, um, and the impact that that does have on not just performance, but ultimately, you know, yourself as a, a functioning, thriving uh, human being. So there's, you know, certainly across the, the professional scene, I think you'd be hard pressed now to find um, a professional club team um, or national team where you don't have a sports psychologist um, on board um, full time, if not that, you know, at least in a, a part time capacity, depending on, yeah, again, the investment in the club or the program. So that's now kind of like an integral part, and rightfully so, um, uh, really truly a, an integral part of the professional landscape. Whereas, yeah, 10 years ago, it was kind of, it wasn't even considered, um, you know, and that's certainly important and a big part of. Uh, what should most definitely be at the forefront of performance, mental health um, across the pro landscape. But I think as we, as we, I guess, continue to invest um, in, you know, youth sports as well, I think, you know, I'm really excited to see and really hopeful that we'll see, um, I guess, a trickle down effect and ultimately look at youth teams um, and, and player pathways where, students and, and young players have access to mental health um, services and support and s- sports psychology support from a younger age because it's about building those foundations if you don't build resilience um, coping mechanisms and just generally performance outlooks you know from a from a young age then it's very very hard to adjust um, once you do get older it's very hard to adjust um, those foundations that you've already built so doing it and getting that support as early as possible is only going to become more and more paramount yeah i agree and now I'm going to shift my questions to myths and untold stories. So all athletes want to make it to the top level, whether it is the NFL or NBA. Can you shed light on the reality and the untold story of how many athletes truly do get to that level? Yeah, um, it's a. I can probably give you a stat. Um, I think it's, yeah, no, it definitely is. If we look at 
collegiate athletes that ultimately end up progressing through to a professional career, it's under 2% of collegiate athletes, which is truly like an astronomical number, I think, in most kids' heads, and not just in mine, but certainly a lot of athletes that I played with or athletes that I knew um, across a whole multitude of different sports, I think most of us think like, oh, it's like a 50-50 shot. You know, those are pretty good odds, but it's sub 2%, um, which is, yeah, quite a stark statistic, um, but a harsh reality of um, ultimately the progression from collegiate sports, which is a already a really high level of, of play right through to the professional setting. So it's a pretty tough thing to do. Um, and certainly the odds aren't as favorable as I think um, one would naturally assume. So roughly like 2% make it to the professional leagues, but how many people and athletes get it to like NCA, Division One, Division Two, and Division Three? Uh, it's spread out across all divisions. So if you look at D1, um, the, the rates are a lot lower than the likes of D2 and then D3. Um, again, those are astronomically like low numbers as well. Um, it depends on the sport as well. But I mean, across the board, you're looking at maybe 10-ish percent, 5 to 10 percent across the three divisions that go out of high school and actually end up um, in collegiate sports. So the numbers are just way, way, way lower than again one would naturally assume i got it and you spoke to me about the financial insecurities that an athlete has when they're not at the top level like the nba Mm -hmm. the myth is that all athletes make a lot of money when in reality this is far from the case can you explain more about that yeah um (laughs) it's a again it's a um it's a pretty tough one um you know when you're thinking about getting paid to compete um and you know, getting paid a lot of money um, to, I guess, follow your dream. You might have a few sports in the world um, where you're getting paid a, a whole lot of money, um, but I guess even across the top sports and and breaking it down and looking at more niche sports as well. I mean, you can look at Olympians that are paid, you know, tens of millions of, of dollars a year to compete in their sport. Look at the NBA, the LeBron James of the world. Um, and then you look at a sailor at the Olympics or, um, you know, a, a, a co- like a canoeist or a rower, they might be getting just enough to be able to compete at the highest level. So depending on your sport, there's pretty stark contrast, but even at the highest level, not necessarily probably the NBA or the NFL, because they've just, you know, there's so much money invested in the sport across the board. But for most sports and the vast majority of sports, even if you do go pro, um, you'd be hard pressed to be making millions of dollars a year um, at the the lower levels. And, you know, not everybody is a Cristiano Ronaldo or Lionel Messi or LeBron James. Um, You know, not everybody becomes the top, you know, one, two, three percent in their chosen sport internationally. Um, so I think even if you do make it and and do become a professional athlete, um, you need to be really mindful that that doesn't necessarily come with guaranteed millions. And are there any other big myths or misconceptions about athletes that you'd like to like set straight? Ooh, myths or misconceptions. Um, let me see. What are some big ones? Um, Oh, I think a, a pretty big one when it comes to the collegiate sport landscape is that, you know, you're going to, you know, if you get recruited, um, even if you're a top recruit going into the collegiate setting, that um, you're going to be in an environment where you're going to be able to come in, compete and play right off the bat. One of the big things that we have to talk with a lot of our student athletes about is that because collegiate sport is so competitive, um, it's really hard to, especially in a in a in a teams based sport, to be able to go in as a freshman and like be able to contribute right away. So a lot of athletes think, brilliant, you know, I'll get recruited and I'll be able to compete across my uh, my four years of college. Um, but because it is so competitive and the level is so high, you have to be a pretty uh, incredible athlete coming in as a freshman to be able to get a lot of minutes or a lot of game time right off the bat. So that's that's a that's a pretty um, common myth that we have to debunk more often than not, especially with internationals, um, is that, hey, you know, 
you have to be quite quite good to come in and, and be able to contribute um, in your freshman year. That's great. Thank you. And as a pro athlete, can you give some general tips on sports psychology or sports performance in general? Mm. I mean, one of the big ones that I got right away was just that really simple mindset way of, um, I guess, looking at performance. We talked about um, blue head and red head, which seems very odd is like a, as an overarching kind of thought of, um, you know, looking at, I guess, the mental aspects of performance, the way that um, we look at uh, blue head or the way that it's broken down in um, sports psychology is blue heads like you're, you know, when you're playing incredibly or you're competing really, really well, you're having a great game, um, you know, you're positively contributing, whatever it might be, all of the really great elements and the positive mindsets um, of, of, you know, competing. Basically, it's like your ideal situation or frame of mind that you're in when you're actually competing in your sport. And then, of course, there's there's the redhead, which is nothing's going your way. I mean, for soccer, you've you know, you've not completed all your passes or, you know, you let a goal in or, you know, whatever it might be um, as it pertains to your chosen sport and really thinking so simply about your frame of mind. And I was really an athlete. I'm certainly a um, not just, you know, when it comes to sport, but just in all aspects of my life, I'm a bit of a, um, a perfectionist. So one thing that I really struggled with from quite a young age was always focusing in on the one or two things that I did wrong in a game. And, you know, soccer is a 90 minute game. So if you don't make two passes or you make two errors in a whole 90 minutes, you've played incredibly, um, you know, that would be an incredible game. But I found myself always getting hung up on, you know, the the tackle I missed or the pass that I didn't complete rather than the the 99% of the time that I actually did everything I was supposed to do and, and played really well. So it was a really simple, um, uh, I guess, sports psychology tactic that I was taught right off the bat was, hey, you need to get out of that redhead state of mind and stop, you know, focusing on the one or two little things that you did wrong um, and put, you know, get into that blue head frame of mind of looking at the flip of that and going, okay, if you were a coach or if you were a, a player looking at another player that wasn't yourself and you saw them, you know, do really well 99% of the time in a game or whatever it might be, and they made 1% of errors, you'd be going, oh, you had a fantastic game. So just the switch of mentality. Um, and it was a little, really little um, easy thing that I can do, could do when I was training or, or playing where I could go up, oh, I can see myself getting into that, that redhead space, pull myself out and go back to all of my really key um, foundational, um, you know, pieces of advice and the things that I knew about um, b putting or going into that blue head frame of mind that would kind of pull me out of that way of thinking. So yeah, just trying to, I think, touch on and focus in on and really hone in on the good things that you're doing. And I guess keeping um, your overall performance in perspective. Oh, wow, that's very interesting. I've never heard of that blue head and red head thing. So um. Are there any other important things to keep in mind on and off the field? Maybe something that helped you through your sports career that like during tough times, maybe? Yeah, um, support systems. You know, when we think about mental health um, and, and sports psychology in general, um, I always say and I've always truly believed that, you know, any athlete um, is only as good as the people that you have around you. And that's not just in terms of, how good your teammates might be or, um, you know, how incredible your coaching is. It's also about the people in your life. Um, it might be mentors. It might be siblings. It might be other family members or friends that really prop you up um, for success. Um, and it's about finding your people, you know, and they, they might be blood relatives or they might be your found family or your chosen family that really um, are there to just be there and make sure that on and off the field, in and out of the pool, on and off the court, um, you've you've got the support that you need to be able to train and compete at the level that you want to be able to. And it seems so simple. And I guess to a lot of people, um, 
can can be something that's quite easily overlooked but you know when you're in those dark places or you find yourself where you've had a rough game you know those are the people that you turn to and those are the people that help you get back to a better place um, and are that kind of comfort and place of support so it's really important to to find those people and have solid people in your life where um, yeah, you can turn to when things aren't quite where you'd like for them to be and also to celebrate your victories with, right? Um, you know, you want to know that when you are doing really, really well that you're going to have people alongside you that you can share that success with. That's great. And just my last question is that what are some common mistakes you see many young athletes make that you don't want them to do again? Maybe it could be about performance, scholarships or building relationships with college coaches. Oof, biggest one, biggest one I always come back to um, for any prospective collegiate athlete is when you are thinking about what you want in a school, you have to look beyond the strength of the athletic program. You have to look beyond division, all of those things, rankings. You need to look beyond academic fit as well. Um, yep, you know, it might be a top 50 academic institution in the world. Um, you might be able to study your major there, you know, the, the, the papers that you want to be able to do and um, the major that you want to be able to go into might all align. Um, but the underpinning of being successful in college and, you know, doing really, really well on and off the field or in and out of the, 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 the pool or certainly out of the classroom as well is being happy. Personal preferences uh, again, one of the, the the easiest things to overlook when you're deciding on what program you are ultimately going to go to and, and what school you're ultimately going to end up at. But I always say, focus on the three pillars. Yes, you want a good athletic fit, you want a good academic fit, but you have to have a good personal fit as well. Because the harsh reality um, when you break it down is that you're going to be calling that that community, that university, um, that town, that city, home for the next four years of your life. And if you are not happy in your immediate environment, um, you're not happy with the cultural fit, the location fit, the climate fit, then chances are results aren't going to translate in the classroom and across your chosen sport as well. So it's all about making sure that personally, you're going to thrive as a as a human being um, because again you know more often than not those results won't translate so that's always the best piece of advice i can give to any athlete that's looking at the collegiate pathway yeah that's super insightful any other lasting thoughts or advice you have all in all uh i think you know the u.s pathway is uh, such an interesting one and certainly an incredible opportunity for any athlete whether you're considering going pro or not um i think you know, such an allure of the US pathway to if you are looking at going pro and something to always bear in mind is that um, you don't have to choose. And that's what I love so much about the US, not just for um, international athletes, but certainly for domestic based students in the US as well, is that, um, you know, it might not work out, you might not end up getting drafted or going pro, or you might get to college and play in what is, you know, essentially a professional environment and go, ah, actually pro sports is not good for me. But what I love about the US is you have the duality of being able to study, get an education, but also compete at the highest level as well. Um, so if you are interested in going through this pathway, um, do, do what you can to get the best support around you that you possibly can. So ultimately you can um, find that best fit university and have the best collegiate experience possible. Well, this was great. And it was great speaking to you, Tess. So I, I appreciate all your super knowledgeable outlook and thanks. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening to the My Design Sports Podcast. Before you leave, please show some love for the podcast by subscribing, liking, and commenting. Stay tuned for next month's podcast with a new guest speaker.